name's David. I'm a member of the RCMI. And uh, I'm a simple person, but I am totally confused right now. And uh, I thank you very much for bringing us the other side of the story, but I wonder if you would care to comment on the current, what seems to be a very negative approach by the Canadian government towards Putin and their desires with the Ukraine. Uh, what's going on here every time uh, the leader takes an opportunity, our leader takes an opportunity. Actually, I think the term brinkmanship may come into play here with respect to denigrating Putin and saying things like, uh, or, or has his actions actually been positive in forcing the Russian Federation to moderate this situation? Um, I tend to find Stephen Harper's reactions on foreign affairs incredibly simplistic, moralistic, black and white, and unhelpful. Um, in this case, by personalizing the conflict so much, it, it really, it depri I, I, I'm totally refusing to speak to Russia about anything, makes it extremely difficult to find any sort of solution. Because, you know, um, if you have a conflict, the people you actually need to speak to are the people you're in conflict with. Okay, so therefore saying, you know, we're in conflict with you, therefore we won't speak with you, is, you know, it, it relies on the assumption that they're just evil, right? Um, which, which isn't true. Now, let's not say, you know, the Russians have not misbehaved, okay? But uh, no, nobody has behaved well in this conflict. Not the Russians, not the West, not the rebels, not the Ukrainian government. Um, why Harper does that? It could well be just the way he views the world. It could well be because you know he's wooing the Ukrainian lobby, um, which in in Canada adopts a very nationalistic, um, quite extreme position. Um, or it could be some combination of, of, of that. But I certainly don't regard it as, as helpful. Though. You know, with sanctions and so on, like, you know, we don't really understand and know very well the decision-making processes within the Kremlin. Okay? So we know Surkov's in there somewhere, right? Uh, uh, and Putin's in there somewhere, and various other people in there somewhere, but quite what the dynamic is, we don't really understand. And are sanctions and pressure strengthening the hands of the doves, or are they strengthening the hands of the hawks? Well, we, we just, we, 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 we don't know. Uh, Gary McGreen, I'm a member of the RCMI as well. So you, you painted the picture of, uh, of Russia wanting to keep Ukraine together. Uh, but surely that there's more to it. They want to keep Ukraine together. They want to keep a pro-Russian Ukraine together. They're not interested simply in having a united Ukraine. They're, they're interested in having a united Ukraine that is pro-Russian, I, I, uh, I would gather. Um, and so. And if you really were interested in sort of a, a moderate um, and peaceful negotiating process, you wouldn't supply rebels with arms. Um, well, it depends how you view it. I mean, we, we seem to think in the West that you know, let's find Syrian rebels with arms and that will solve that problem. You know? so, so people often think in very strange ways. Um, Moscow wants to put, I, I think, personally, okay, that Moscow wants to put Donbass back in Ukraine, but not, not on any terms whatsoever, if only because it's not domestically possible, okay? So, so Russia, from a simple point of view of domestic politics, it is not possible for the Russian government to allow the Ukrainian rebels to be militarily defeated. Okay, that, that, that cannot, Putin could not stand in front of Russian people and allow, allow that to happen, okay? So, so they have to be given enough support to, 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 to hold their own. And also enough support to coerce Ukrainian government to talk to them. Okay, so so in reply to your question, you know, the Russians do regard um, arming rebels as a sort of way of trying to get peace through coercing the government to to talk. Because if you notice, the only two times there have been progress, uh, Minsk one and Minsk two, have been when the Ukrainian army has been defeated. And all of a sudden, when the Ukrainian army is defeated, the Ukrainian government becomes a bit more malleable and, and starts, you know beginning to, to consider something, and then there's a ceasefire and the military situation isn't quite so bad and they, they start becoming a bit more stubborn again. So, so from Moscow's point of view, um, coercion makes some sense, but I don't think it's actually going to work because I think you know, they're finding the Ukrainians are much more stubborn than they, they had imagined them to be, okay? And therefore, 
Moscow is ending up with something it doesn't really want, which is a, the, these um, puppet states which are, are, are not really viable and everything else. And no one really wants that, but that's kind of what's happening. Uh, Professor Robinson, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Jacques Damaris. I'm a member of the RCMI as well. Um, I wonder if you didn't touch on Crimea other than in passing. And I, I just wonder if you could take a few minutes. I don't know if Crimea could be considered an elephant in the room. You talked about strategy, the Ukrainians screwing it up. Uh, Crimea preceded all of this. And uh, I can't help but uh, I'd be very interested in your thoughts as to whether strategically Russia has sort of achieved its strategic objective. And a lot of the story has shifted uh, to this other forum. And if this were resolved from a Russian perspective appropriately, their objective remains seized, intact, and uh, secured. And the one thing I don't know enough about is why Khrushchev sort of reassigned Crimea to the Ukrainian then state back in the 60s, as I recall. Anyway, I've loaded up. Uh, yeah. sort of On the Khrushchev's answer, I don't really know, apart from the fact from a point of view of socialist planned economy, it can make much more sense to have Crimea in Ukraine because all its fuel and water and everything else comes through Ukraine, so in terms of central planning, it's administratively more convenient. Um, I think you are right that securing Crimea is the primary Russian objective. Um, Donbass, they made it clear really pretty much from the beginning that they don't want it. Um, but there, there's certainly the nationalist circles in, in Russia think that if you lose in Donbass, then they'll come for Crimea. So you, you've got to hold the line in Donbass because once they get that, if they get that back, then they'll come. They'll come. So it, it's all like a buffer for, for Crimea to a certain degree in, in, in the strategic thinking of these Russian nationalist uh, circles. Um, the seizure of Crimea but did have an extremely negative effect on this entire uh, conflict in Donbass. Um, in the first place, it encouraged revolt in Donbass. Because initially, a lot of the people who seized government buildings in Donbass thought that if they did that, the Russians would come. And this is again to me as evidence that the Russians weren't really behind all those government building seizures. Because if they had been, the guys seizing the building would have known that the Russian army wasn't coming. Right? But this is a really bad idea. Um, but they really did seem to think that if they, they just grabbed a few buildings, Russian army would come like Crimea. So, so it encouraged this whole process. At the same time, it also created a, a victim mentality in Kiev. So from the moment that the Russians took over Crimea, uh, the, the, the Kiev government has viewed everything through the lens of Russian aggression. Okay? Uh, and therefore, everything is seen as the problem of Russia. And that means that they, they are incapable of understanding their own contribution to their own problems. So, so Crimea really, and it had the same effect on Western public opinion and Western governments. Okay? We can't see beyond Russia because of the Crimea, and therefore we can't see what, what Kiev has done wrong. Okay? So uh, psychologically, okay, Crimea has, has really um, shaped the way this whole conflict is framed in a very negative way. Okay, and, and, and made it much harder to make progress. And so in that extent, the Russians are responsible for what happens in Donbass because they, they um, by seizing Crimea, they, they set all these things in motion. And Hi, uh, my name's uh, Francis Witt, and I follow your blog, and I really admire your work, and I'm very grateful for what you said today. I just have a couple of things. Are you really concentrated on Donbass? But I just wanted to mention a few other things to you know, the Kiev, the it was obviously a putsch. I mean, I watched it. I saw it on television. We saw these people uh, uh, throwing uh, Molotov cocktails, the police running. I mean, this doesn't happen if a, in a normal demonstration with unarmed demonstrators. It just doesn't happen. They were obviously... I mean, uh, there's an article in the newspaper saying, oh, the Kievian uh, Kiev put on rebellion or whatever was done by pianos, people playing pianos in the streets. And we saw it on television. I don't know how people can be deceived by that. And also we saw John Baird there, Victoria Newland there, Catherine Ashton there. I, I mean for goodness sake, they're shouting out uh Yat is gonna be in the government. I mean come on. I, I, this is that happened. And uh, these people are still there and still sort of continually trying to get war. So I just don't know how people can be and yet Harper, I mean, I really agree with you. I'm terribly upset about what Harper's done. He keeps saying, I get letters from them, from the Conservative Party, because I belong to the Conservative Party. They say, the people in Ukraine were fed up 
this. I got this from what's his name, very fast in the future. Uh, minister, uh, I, I just, you know, they were fed up and that's why they got rid of the uh, Yanukovych. And completely mi missing, I mean, how can anybody not believe that? The second question is, uh, Odessa, what happened in Odessa? Because uh, it seems to be there was a terrible massacre there and uh, probably genocide there, but it, that's also totally denied. I mean, the West just doesn't admit that that happened at all. Finally, Macedonia, I'm very close to Macedonia, Western Macedonia, and spent a lot of time there's in um, uh, Altrid, which is probably on the border of Albania. And it looks as if the West, and Moody Harper, is trying to make, in order to destroy Russia, is trying to cut them off from oil completely and uh, stop this Turk stream thing. And they're trying to destroy Greece, trying to destroy uh, uh, a Macedonian making regime change now in Macedonia is threatened. And that is terribly uh, upsetting to me, because that's why I'm very close to that part. So I just wanted to know if you could just say you know, a little bit about that. Okay, um I mean, I agree that the Maidan protests were not peaceful, but they were continually uh, declared in, in the rest of the media to be peaceful protests. So they, they began peacefully, but they were very soon hijacked by some very nasty people who, who instigated most of the violence. So mo most violence was instigated by the Maidan protests, not by the police. I think that, that is fairly evident. Uh, and I even got reports from pro Maidan Western people who were observing it who, who say as much. Um, uh, and what happened was an unconstitutional coup. But, but, I mean, the, 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 the Ukrainian constitution has a very clearly laid out uh, legislation, a uh, rule on an impeachment of the president that was not followed. Okay, so, so the, the process by which Yanukovych removed was illegal. Uh, and this is the cause of the problems, to my, to my view, it is, is a problem of legi <coughs> legi legitimacy. Okay, and, and those of you who study counterinsurgency will know that you know counterinsurgencies are a struggle for legitimacy. And this is really the central problem: is that Donbass has never regarded the government in Kiev as legitimate. And the more Kiev has tried to overcome them by force, the more they've been inclined to view it that way. Um, Odessa is complicated. Um, Forty people were killed in the trade union house. Um, what seems to have happened, the best I can reconstruct it, is that. Some anti-government protesters attacked some pro-government protesters first, but that was in a different part of town, okay? Uh, uh, and so there was shooting going on and fighting going on in a different part of town. And then the, the pro-government guys beat off the anti-government guys, and then they marched across town to the trade union building and set it on fire, okay? Uh, and 40 people were killed uh, in that. And again, it's very interesting to see how this. Um, these kind of things are reported in the Western media. The Odessa fire was not reported as pro-government protesters killed 40 people. It was a fire broke out and 40 people died. Similarly, like when Ina Kukurutsa was killed, the, the uh, media reporting of it in, in the Global Mail and Audible Citizen and so on was, there was an explosion in a building in Lugansk. So it's very interesting how the, the, these things are phrased. Um, Whereas when the rebels kill some civilians, it's always rebels kill some civilians. It's very interesting. Um, Macedonia, it's interesting actually, the, 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 uh, the many people, well not many, but the, the more right-wing commentators in America are blaming Putin for the um, problems in Macedonia. Okay, um, so we're blaming uh, the Americans and the Americans are blaming Putin. Um, again, on my personal feeling, we're probably like in Ukraine, these are primarily domestic problems with domestic concerns. Gentlemen in the back, that's the first step. Um, there's conflicting information in the, in the Donbass region that their industrial and their mining is expended, is pretty much over. And then there's another point of view saying that, that it's still very wealthy and, and and, with, uh, and worth a great deal of uh, money to the Russians. And so, do you know the truth of the matter? Is is are they still are the mines still workable and the steel industry still viable? Or are they baffed out as some other pundits say? Well, they are, they are declining industries. I think there's no there's no doubt about that. Um, they have been sustainable for many years, in part because of Russian subsidies through cheap gas. Now, the problem. Uh, insofar as you want, if you want to see economic causes of this whole conflict, were the um, association with the European Union requires the ending of all subsidies, right? uh, and, and it requires you know 
total liberalization of the market within Ukraine and so on. And this will uh, have a highly destructive effect upon the uh, industries in, in eastern Ukraine. Particularly, um, loss of the Russian market will be very severe because the Russians have made it very clear that they're willing to have customs-free trade with Ukraine, but not if Ukraine has customs-free trade with the European Union because then Ukraine just becomes a conduit for getting around Russian customs barriers. Okay, from the European Union. So if, if uh, Ukraine joins up with the EU, then tariffs go up against Ukraine, um, and that mean that that has a highly deleterious effect upon the the uh, the, the Rust Belt of, of Donbass. Um, so um, it's not the EU agreement, at least in the short term, short medium term, is not in the interests of, of of the people of Donbass, and clearly their economic interests look more e eastwards. So, so that does have some sort of effect on culture. After that Crimea invasion, all the Russian troops need to go up to the border, the eastern border between Ukraine and Russia. Why did that happen? What was the strategic value of that Russian troop builder? Well, we don't really know. Again, the problem with a lot of this is it's all hidden, right? So it is possible that in early April, the Russian government was considering, as an option, moving into Donbass. That's right. Okay, so, um, and in fact, the, the, the Duma passed legislation giving the president the right to do that. And then, in sometime around 20th of April, Putin revoked that permission. So, around mid-April, mid-late April, a decision was made not to do it. But it, it, it is not impossible that it was being considered as an option at one point, and they were undergoing taking contingency measures. But to what extent these were actual real planning or contingency measures or what, we, we, we don't know because they don't tell us. And we don't have a spy, you know, in Putin's bedroom but it telling us what's going on. But it must have had a moral effect on the Ukrainians. Well, I mean, again, it, it, it reinforced this view in Ukraine that all their problems were due to Moscow. Right? Uh, uh, and you know, Moscow's behavior has kind of reinforced this self-defeating mentality which exists within Kiev. So, so uh, Bob Cook, um, I guess my question is, how do you see all of this playing out? So obviously there are a lot of conflicting forces and we've identified that there's some serious uh, domestic issues, but I think because uh, it's in sort of a traditional sort of neutral zone, you have Russia now backing its segment in sort of a paradoxical way because they do want a, a peace element to uh, reintegrate these rebel areas. But they're doing that, you know, to show their support, you know, putting more weapons in the area, and that's never going to lead to peace. And this sort of buildup has caused NATO, the US, the UK to have a similar reaction that's just stopped them deploying further. Uh, resources. I think they want to go from Italian to brigade level resources uh, from Eastern Europe. So, how do you see this playing out? Is it going to, how, you know, is it going to be, uh, you know, the Ukrainian army will take a serious hit, and then the Ukrainian government will come to the table? What do you think? I hate to predict, so every prediction I make is wrong. <laughs> um, so I think it's probably be ninety percent of predictions and ninety percent of pundits on, on this issue. Um, Militarily, neither side at present has the ability to knock the other side for six months. I mean, that's very clear. Um, the only way the military situation could change dramatically would be an enormous increase of Russian support to the rebels. I, I don't think there's any support the West can give the Ukrainian government which would enable them to defeat the rebels. The, the, the Russians could give enough to, to, to enable the rebels to, to uh, inflict another severe defeat on the Ukrainians. I'm not sure though that they, the Russians want to do that unless the Ukrainians break the ceasefire in a really serious, serious way. Um, so the question then comes is will they, will this sort of stalemate be used to negotiate a settlement? Well, um, in academic theory, something called ripeness theory, and ripeness theory suggests that civil wars end when there is a mutually hurting stalemate, okay, and both sides realize that, you know, there's no point continuing. The problem is that point two generally occurs a long time after point one, right? 
So you get to mutually hurting stalemate, but still people think that somehow something might change. Okay, so from the Ukrainian side, they think, well, the West is backing us to the hilt, so we don't need to compromise. Because, you know, maybe there'll be a Putin will fall from power or, or, or something, right? Um, or perhaps the, the blockade they're doing, remember they're blockading um, Donbass, and, and the, the strategy seems to be, let's make, make life utterly miserable for everybody in Donbass, so that in the end they get fed up with these rebels and want to come back to them. Like, you know, years from now, okay? Um, and that way we can reintegrate peacefully. Okay, and, and as long as they believe that is a possibility, then they keep going, right? And refuse to compromise. Similarly, on the rebel side, they may think, well, you know, that Ukrainian economy is like going down the hill at an amazingly rapid rate. They've got inflation of 60%. Uh, the economy fell by 17% GDP last year. Um, Yatsenyuk, Prime Minister, has an approval rating of 1.6%. Um, you know, there's going to be another revolution before long in, in Kiev, and, and then, you know, we can exploit that to get a better deal. So, as long as people are thinking like that, okay, they, they won't agree to the compromise which is necessary. So, I may be proven wrong about this, and it could well be that somehow they come up with constitutional amendments which are mutually um, uh, agreeable, but more likely is that we're going to have a low-level conflict which is frozen roughly along the current front line um, for quite a while. Which is actually the worst solution for everybody. Okay? Um, but stubbornness on all sides uh, 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 and a refusal to face reality will be that's what we get. But I've been wrong on most other things, so maybe the good news is I'll be wrong about that. <laughs> Um, just, just a question about the Germans. I can't believe that they don't know what's going on to some depth with the Kremlin and its position of, if, if you take your position of pushing it back into Ukraine and setting it up, where are they falling in on this? They're not, you know, they're not slow off the mark, these guys, and, and they're right in the middle of it. So I'm, I'm curious as to... Um, I mean, Germany has a much stronger, I wouldn't say pro, much stronger force domestically for having a settlement with Russia than any other country in the West because German trade with, with Russia is very, very large. Um, that said, Angela Merkel is very hostile to Vladimir Putin. She, she thinks that Putin has personally lied to her. Right? And she does not trust him. Okay? And therefore, she is actually quite hard line. Okay? She's much more hard line, really, than, than German public opinion, I think. At the same time, you know, she is trying through this Minsk process to, 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 to broker some sort of settlement. So, so the Germans are doing what they can um, to push things forward. Okay? From my point of view, the real obstacle doesn't really lie in Moscow so much as in Kiev, because um, when you look at these, you know, rebel proposals for constitutional amendments, then obviously there are bits which would be unacceptable, but overall, they're not, you know, incredibly awful that, you know, two provinces would have some special status and local autonomy over agriculture and, and museums, right? I mean, it, it's not, is it really worth killing thousands of people over? And the answer is not, but they're not willing to do it in Kiev. And, and I, I see no indications of, there being, of them moving towards being willing to do it. Um, but we don't pressure that, okay? We don't need to pressure the Russians or something. That's what happens. So, Mike Verstalio, Percy, my member. <clears throat> so, my understanding is there's a very strong ethnic Russian ethnic population in Ukraine, and which is spurring this rebel impetus. But what is the what are the roots of, of the, between their own government, the Ukrainian government, and has to go back to your conversation at some time? Is is the these rebels they felt in essence that the government is not not treating the, the, those ethnic Russians, in essence, or is this just a government a push by these? Russian ethnics to create their own state within the state. Well, strictly speaking, they're not Russian ethnics. They're actually, okay. they're, they're Ukrainian, for the most part, they're Ukrainians who speak Russian. Okay. Um, and this is true, I mean, there's, there's millions of these across, across Ukraine. Um, Donbass is slightly different, though, because Donbass has a, a very strong regional identity. So if you look at studies of identity and you ask people in Donbass, how do you identify yourself? A certain percentage will say Ukrainian, a certain percentage will say uh, Russian, but the, the, the most popular um, 
response is, I'm from Donbass. Okay, so, so there is a very strong regional identity, um, and it's wrapped up in things um, such as um, the mining industry in the Soviet era. Okay, um, so this, this uh, Soviet established some degree, um, a working class culture, um, and you'll find that most of the rebels are really working class people rather than um, you know the intelligentsia. Okay, so there is a class element to this. Um, the Second World War, this is extremely important, the Great Patrick World War, as I call it, this is an extremely central part of the identity for defeating the Nazis. And this is why um, Ukrainian nationalists love of the uh, um, OUN and Stepan Bandera and these people who um, fought against the Soviets in the Second World War is, is incredibly toxic in, in, in Donbass. And economic interests which are distinct um, from um, from Western Ukraine, and there is a certain empathy with Russia, okay, Russian culture and so on, okay, um, and this was able to survive within the same state as a completely different culture, which is the culture that you have in, in ex, its extreme form in, in, in Galicia, which loathes the Soviet Union, loathes Russia. Okay, regards the people who fought the Nazis in the Second World War as heroes, okay, and so on. Okay, and it was able to live together with that, ident with that other identity as long as both sides kind of let each other alone. But what happened with the overthrow of Yanukovych was um, really an attempt to impose one side's historical memory on the entire nation. Okay. And, and then you can see that with the destruction of Soviet symbols and so on. And then with the, the statement that we will no longer be pro-Russian, we will be part of the EU, we will be part of NATO, okay? The, the, the government which is in power is, a, is essentially a revolutionary government, which believes that the economic and social problems of the country are wrapped up in a warped Soviet nostalgia and, and bad identity, which has to be extirpated in order for, for there to be progress and that the identity of the nation needs to be rewritten, okay? And there may actually be some truth to that, you know, I, I, I don't actually personally like Lenin statues, I think Lenin was a first-rate bastard, you know, and, and um, you know, uh, the Soviet mentality may, may well be a bad thing, and, and the Western Ukrainians may well be right in regarding Donbass working-class people as Sovoks, which is, you know, people of a, uh, a Soviet mentality and so on. But, even if they're right, and I'm not saying where they are, but even if they are right, attempting to actually make that public policy is suicidally stupid. Okay? Because, you know, when you try and, and, and extirpate someone's identity, they're, they're going to strike back. And, and that's really what's happened. Um, and um, I don't think either in Kiev they don't get it, they just don't understand that or they just don't care. And um, they're determined to press ahead with their, as they call it, modernizing European agenda regardless. Okay. And, and certainly there are some people who don't care. You will get Ukrainian spokesmen who will say, these Donbass people, they're savages, they're a bunch of, you know, it's class element, you know, but they're, they're like working class miners and tractor drivers, they're Soviets, they're backward thinking, they're retrograde, you know, they've got to be extra, you know, we, we've got to get rid of all of that, okay? So there are some people who, who clearly just don't care because they don't like what they see in Eastern Ukraine. Um, but there are others who I think just don't really quite get what reaction their own nation state building effect has on other people because they're so convinced of the rightness of their own policies that, that they, they can't if anyone opposes this, it must be because they're wrong. And if they're wrong, we don't have to pay attention to them. Which is really bad policies, because even if they are wrong, you still have to pay attention to them. Because if they're going to rebel against you, you should perhaps think twice. And I think that's a lot. So identity is, is, is an important part of it all. But in a more complex way than just pro-Russian, pro-Ukrainian, or ethnic types. Time for one last question. Chris, please do. Shimon Garcia, my member. Paul, um, at this point, Western support for Ukraine has been uh, largely rhetorical. Yeah. I mean, sending a company of 
uh, soldiers, representing a company of soldiers to train uh, <clears throat> in, in Ukraine armies. A monstrous military effort. Can you see any tipping point at which um, actually military support for Ukraine might actually intensify on behalf of the West, or is there some sort of immutable barrier? Um, pressure for that is much stronger in North America than it is in Europe, in part because we, we are more distant from it. Uh, pressure is, is very intense in Congress in the United States and among the hawks in, in um, the presidential administration in the United States, who may notionally be, be members of a Democratic Party, but are actually very hawkish. The Samantha Powers and the Newlands and the, the Hillary Clintons um, are, are really, really quite aggressive on foreign policy. Um, and pretty much any person holding them back, I think, is, is Obama. And he's able to do that because the European allies won't support it because they're much closer to it and they kind of realize, you know, hey, hang on, we don't really want this getting any worse. Um, the tipping point, if it was to be one, would be another major breakdown of the ceasefire. So what we have at the moment is fighting every day, but fighting which kills maybe one person a day. Okay. It's not all out war all across the, the front every day. And although both sides are breaking the ceasefire and both sides have artillery close to the front lines, which they shouldn't have, they moved most of it back, right? So, so they could be killing a lot more of each other. So if there was to be another massive breakdown, which was to be clearly the fault of the rebel side, then it would become much harder for Obama to, to uh, continue to say no. Um, and at that point, you might see a provision of weapons. Now, I personally don't think it's a good idea. I, mean, I said in another speech here in front of a couple of months ago that the Ukrainian army is a sort of conduit for which weapons go to the rebels. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, if you want the rebels to have javelin missiles, by all means, give them, give them to the Ukrainian army. Um, but people are not very bright, I think, very often. And, and, and um, of course, Russia, en it, Russia enjoys what we call escalation dominance, you know. Um, it matters a lot more to them, and they're closer. So if we send, you know, some javelin missiles, well, they're saying, you know, three times more javelin missiles, or the equivalent of Russia. So, so, I don't believe it would ever achieve anything, but the, the politics could change if, particularly if Russia was mounted another major incursion. It seems very hard to prove. I mean, it's never, even the last one, it's never, in August, it's never, you know, it's not like we've actually got photographs of um, these guys. Um, but that's what it would take, I think. Can I ask one question? Who shot down the plane? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably the rebels. Probably. Um, in late June, it was reported that they had overrun their Ukrainian air defense base and that they had captured a Buk <clears throat> missile. Well, they captured the what's called a transporter, erector, erector, launcher, and radar. So it's, it's, it's just it's the vehicle on which the missiles are. But they didn't capture all the rest of the bits like the separate radar you need and the command and control modules or something, okay? And um, so it was believed that they had one of these things. And they had been shooting down planes in that area the week before. So because they were shooting down planes in that area, I tend to the view that they were the ones shooting down planes, so it's probably that. However, some people say that you can't actually shoot down a jetliner with a book teller without all the other bits. I don't I actually personally understand the, the technical aspects of it. Um, so that may or may not be true. Also, the Ukrainians had complained that the Russians had shot down their planes. So when these planes were shot down before the Malaysian Airlines, the Ukrainians said, it's the Russian Air Force which did it. And we know it's the Russian Air Force because the Ukrainian the rebels don't have any anti-aircraft missiles. So they are actually the Ukrainian official position before Malaysian Airlines was that the rebels couldn't do it. And that it was the Russian Air Force. And that would explain why the Ukrainian army probably did have air defense units in the area. Because they either believed, at least, or at least they were saying that the Russian Air Force was active, and so they brought in air, air defense missiles. So theoretically, it could have been Ukrainians. But, you know, 
Andy Cunningham did shoot down a, a civilian airliner in 2001. Um, this was a uh, uh, Siberian Airlines plane from uh, Tel Aviv to Novosibirsk. Uh, it was flying over the Black Sea. The Ukrainians were doing their defense exercise and um, shot it down by mistake. So, so they, they have a track record of proven incompetence. Um, so I don't think you can rule the Ukrainian army out, but my personal instinct is that it's more likely to be the rebels. Simply, simply because they were the ones who were shooting things down in that area and because it was believed at the time that they had the relevant, or at least one part of the relevant uh, missile system. But I, I, can't, I can't prove that. So, just if, if, they, if they shot it down, are you suggesting that they shot it down knowing it was a foreign No, airline? probably they just, no, because they didn't have the entire system. All they had was the, the, the uh, tracked vehicle with the missiles on it. Okay? To actually know what you're shooting at, you've got to have the associated radar and command and control model. Okay, so it's possible that they just saw something in the sky and thought, well, anything which is flying over a war zone must be a Ukrainian plane. And then they just pointed and pressed the button and hoped for the best and happened to hit it. Um, that's possible. But some people say it was a cloudy day and they couldn't possibly have seen it. And if they couldn't see it, and they didn't have the radar, why would they? But you know, I, I, there's so many conspiracy theories floating around this. I, I've lost track, frankly, and, and I hesitate to give any uh, any answer. This concludes today's webcast. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for listening. You can keep up with coming events at the RCMI by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. We hope you'll tune in again, and we hope to see you in person at coming events. Thank you, and goodbye.